All right, so the ITP 481 final this year. It's all over and done. You've seen your results. You might be thinking, yeah, but it's too late to do anything about it, isn't it? It may be too late to change your grade, but it's not too late to learn some stuff. If that's the goal, you can get a little more practice. You can learn more, see a new perspective, uh, and maybe apply these things going forward. This is what I call the baseline. This is just my own brute, brute force implementation, no particular emphasis made on optimizations. I just made the unit test pass and then run the test. It's in release mode, so the code has been optimized. All right, it runs in just under 11 seconds, um, and that's where I got the baseline from. Let's compare that with uh, one of the student submissions. Here we have, um, this is, I've chosen this one because it happens to be the slowest. And I don't, at, a, at first glance, I don't see anything that's obviously a reason for that. Let's run it. And it comes in at over 20 seconds, so almost twice as long. Um, so we would think there'd probably be something pretty significantly different about these implementations. Um, but if you just compare them, let's compare them side by side here. Uh, here's my baseline. Here's the student submission for the, for the, the outer loop. Um, they're essentially the same. We are going to loop over all the objects in the scene. We are going to do a ray cast against that object. If the object hits, we will do a minimum test to see if um, it's the smallest fraction. So that's right here. And then if it is, we will keep track of the info from the smallest fraction. There are a few things in here that are implemented a little different, like these are copied individually, whereas mine is copied with the block. Um, it's possible that the, the compiler found an optimization there. Um, seems unlikely. Uh, the other thing is that the min t variable is being kept separately, whereas I'm, I've combined it with my best info. It's, again, it's possible that that's a, that's a difference. But in tinkering with it, I have found that actually the difference lies a little deeper. Let's go to this raycast function and see what it does. And we will see um, all this is doing is doing a transform and then uh, going into soup raycast. Now, right here, there is an optimization. We'll come back to this later. Uh, and this, is, this version, the slowest submission, actually contains a decent optimization. So why is it so slow? Let's go in here and we will find it. Right here, that one line right there is the bulk of the slowdown. This is making a copy of a triangle. So we're constructing a new triangle based on the old triangle. If we simply make that a reference, make it a const reference, and so that will not make a copy. Let's run it again and see what we get. All right, as you can see, we went from 20 seconds to 13 and a half seconds with a couple of keystrokes. Uh, and the, that really highlights, I, I really want to highlight the importance of this one innocuous line. Instead of making a copy of the triangle, I have changed it to simply reference the existing triangle. And that difference alone has saved me uh, quite a big chunk of the time. This cast info is inside the loop. Now, technically, that's telling the compiler to construct a new one of these each time it goes through the loop. Now, it should be the same spot on the stack. But if there's anything in that constructor, like setting those variables to zero each time, 
that would cost us a little bit of time. So let me just kick that one out and go again. And it's 13.3 seconds. Um, not, maybe not significant, but I'm gonna leave it. I think that's, at least it's a marginal improvement. Let's go in and see if that same pattern has been replicated anywhere else. Um, do, 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 do. How about point inside? Indeed, look at these. We're making copies of vectors, local copies of existing vectors. You know what, let's do this. Look at this trick. Okay, let's make references out of those. Still 13.3, so didn't find any boost from that one. I noticed this because it doesn't seem necessary because I know the algorithm. But even if I do not know the algorithm, I should be able to just numerically analyze this function and see that this is a if something divided by something is less than zero. So this is a sign check. And so that only matters if area can be negative. If area can be positive or negative, that'll flip the sign. Um, but area is a length. So area cannot be negative. So I do not need this divide by. And while I'm at it, I don't know why we're using doubles. Let's use a float. Um, we we'll use a float here as well. We'll get rid of the area. So this is just basic uh, numerical optimization. Okay, now I'll get rid of that semicolon too, just because it bugs me. All right, let's see if that changing the, the doubles to floats had any impact on anything. So 13.27, so um, it's just that minor improvement. Um, while I'm at it, I'm gonna see if anyone used any doubles anywhere. Yeah, here's a double. What do we need a double for? That's not a double, it's a float. Um, any other doubles? Okay. I'm sure there are more little places where we can find optimizations. Oh, what's this? Here's another one. Okay, the triangle get normal is called a lot. Let's see if that does anything. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Okay, so the big finds that we that we hit were these copies of variables, just variables just that are being copied into locals, and the optimized compiler did not strip those out. Um, it, it left those in, and uh, and that cost you a lot of time. So you can get rid of it by just making them references, or honestly, in my version, I think what you'll find for the same thing. This is triangle get normal, triangle get normal. I think you'll find I just referenced the original content directly, and I didn't uh, didn't make temporary variables. But the creation of a temporary variable has really knocked you on this one. It has taken you from, uh, from 10 seconds, under 10 seconds now we are, because of the optimization that you made here, you're under 10 seconds, but because of the copying variables that pulled you up over 20 seconds. So it's doubling your speed just because of these references uh, of variables. To summarize that one, the big find there is do not make unnecessary copies of your data. You can use references like these so that it is not a copy of the data. That'd be okay. Or just reference the original data directly in your code. Either one of those is going to be fine. But just get in the habit of doing that instead of making a copy. Um, I would characterize this not so much as an optimization as just a good habit. Try to just get in the habit of doing it that way so that you don't have to spend time after the fact optimizing. Next, 
let's look at the optimization that this student did take and the, the one that has gotten them from the 11 seconds of my baseline to under 10 seconds for this now that we've cleaned that up. This is a, another category of optimizing that I would describe as um, knowing that it's slow. When you write some code and you call a function and you know that the function that you call is slower than you wish it was, then that sort of leaves a known opportunity there to optimize. And this student has taken that. The matrix inverse function is known to be slow. So let's look at the original. This is the, the baseline version um, that has no optimization in it. And you can see that there is a, a matrix inversion right here. A, a matrix invert is called. And if we go to that function, all right, we go to that function, we'll see the comment right, right away even says that this is slow. And this is something we all know is, you know, suboptimal. So knowing that we've called this leads to the suggestion that perhaps we could uh, optimize by instead making a faster version of that. And that's what this student has done. Um, this is a get inverse function instead of an invert function. That's so it's different. We can take a look and see what they have done. This, uh, yeah, this version exploits something that we've described before, which is knowing that the matrix in question is an affine matrix. It was made from scale, translation, and rotation. And so the, uh, this, question, this, this time we can, we can extract the scale, and then we can extract the translation. We can invert the translation, and do a, do a transpose for the rotation part and applying the, the inverse scale. Um, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then combining those two to get the result. And that should be faster. And in, in fact, I notice another optimization staring me right in the face here. And that is that the scale squared is what is being referenced here, not the scale itself, but the scale squared. And when we got the scale, we could have got the scale squared instead. Um, although I see here that there's a scale divided by scale. That seems unnecessary. So let's see if we can optimize this a little bit. Okay, so my scale now is the scale squared of each row. Um, I have, I'm a little annoyed that I have copied some data into a temporary vector. Um, yeah, a little annoyed by that. I could optimize that one away, perhaps. Let's first just see if this still works. It's slower. Um, it worked, but it's substantially slower. So that just goes to show that you have to have to test it. You have to time it to see what the impact of what you're doing actually is. You can't just assume. I'm going to create a new function, scale squared. And I will now call scale squared. Go. Okay, now it's faster. Um, amazing. What's the takeaway from this one? This is an example of knowing that a function was slow and striking directly at it, really without any profiling to verify what that would do or any greater analysis. And it does tend to be a decent way to approach the problem if you have good reason to think that this inverse function is slow. And the other thing that we did was just a little bit of like numerical optimization, just analyzing and looking and seeing what looked like redundant steps, taking those out. And 
One of the key things that we really learned right there was you've got to profile it. You've got to test it to see that your results actually improved anything. Our first pass of what looked like an obvious optimization was actually really, really slowed it down. I suspect what happened is the function got a little bit more complex in terms of the compiler and the compiler decided not to inline the function. Whereas when we simplified it again by collapsing this, taking it from three calls to length squared to a single call to get scale squared, that was enough to re-inline that function and get the speed boost that we were hoping for. So always test your stuff. And that brings me to the next thing I want to bring up, which is profiling. Why, if we don't have any particular reason to think that this inverse function is particularly slow, uh, where do we go next? In fact, this is where I think you should probably start. Uh, the first step, I always say, the first step is profiling. If you're in Visual Studio like this, um, it's rather simple. In other packages, there are similar opportunities to do this. Let me just take you through what I'm going to do. Uh, performance Profiler, right here from the debug menu. I'm going to select Performance Profiler. I'm going to turn on CPU Usage. This is what I want. It's just basically going to uh, time the CPU, and that's what I want. So, boom. I'm going to run the project. It'll go. It is, while it's going, it is timing everything. It's measuring how much time is being spent in every little function. So it's finished. Let's come back over here and see what it came up with. One thing I will note is right here at the beginning, this stuff is uh, set up and that's not part of our timing test. So I want to just narrow it down to, to ignore the ending, ignore the beginning. I just want to know the meat of it. What is the meat of it? And when I highlight this, the functions that are that are the most expensive during that window are going to be shown to me here. Um, the most expensive function in the entire thing is not, in fact, matrix inverse. It is triangle get plane, taking up 62% of the total time all by itself. This is the this is total. This is self. This function alone took 62% of the time. And we can see down here in this lower one, uh, how did that happen? What was the call stack that made that happen? It was from triangle. Triangle was from soup obj, and that was from the speed test function. As we expected, all of this is pretty much as expected. But what we did not anticipate was that triangle get plane was actually the most expensive function. Uh, and if we just click it, we can go and we can see it. All that is, is um, a call to get normal. Uh, and what we're probably seeing really is that the bulk of it was in the get normal, as you can see there, that the get normal function is being called repeatedly. Um, and that brings me to the next suggestion for an optimization, which is redundant calculations. We'll see this by doing the profiler that this call to get plane is being called over and over and over. And in particular, that call to get plane is calling this get normal. So how can I optimize that? The call that really got us was, call, was this get plane and this get normal. So here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to pre-calculate that. I'm going to make a plane. I'm going to make a plane here and the constructor m plane equals plane of a comma get normal. Okay, and then uh, the get normal function, we'll leave it alone for now. The get plane function will return m plane. 
Okay, and that's only going to work if you go through the regular constructor. I do have um, I do have an opportunity for somebody I can see here to fill in the points after the fact, and I believe the soup does that. So they'll need a way to calculate that. Um, and I'll just throw this in here. I don't know, maybe with my other functions, void, uh, let's say calc plane. And that will do, yeah, in fact, that will be right here. So void triangle calc plane is just going to do that. And we'll put a calc plane. And that goes there. I forgot to try again. Oh, something's wrong. OK. Um, the soup constructor needs to call that function, uh, which is the soup, triangle soup, constructor needs to then call m tries i dot calc plane. There we go. How are we doing on speed? Bam. Wow. Um, wow. Okay, so that uh, that had a pretty massive impact. Um, let's take a look at that in the performance profiler and see if there's anything that we can do to follow that pattern up. Now, what's the slowest function? The slowest function now is soup obj raycast, um, and we have plain raycast. Those are fairly expensive uh, in the self. The operator multiply is coming up. Let's see if there's anything we can see about soup obj raycast. What's going on here? Okay, the inverse matrix is taking up 40% of the total time, and then the call itself to soup raycast has been inlined, it looks like, and it's taking. Uh, the bulk of the time. But this gives me a little bit of an opportunity right here, this calculation of the matrix inverse. I wonder if we can't do the same trick to that and see if we get a little improvement there as well. Okay. Um, soup object has a matrix, and I'll just make a matrix for M in mat. And go to definition here, and we will say um, m in mat equals uh, m obj. No, wait, it was a matrix for colon colon get inverse of m obj to world. And now let's make use of that. That would be in soup obj raycast right here bam there's another big speed up just by caching up data that does not need to be recalculated over and over um, now I've said this before, time it, time it, time it, test it. You need to see how this is going to impact things in your application, in your use case. Because what we have done here, keep in mind, we have added extra data to our object, and that means we are going to burn through our cache faster as we access these different objects. So if you access that object uh, in, in a pattern such that the cache is the bottleneck, then adding this extra data will cause you to slow down. Whereas we've seen here that the bottleneck is apparently the calculation. And so by adding this extra piece of data, we have sped things up. 
using these little optimizations, we have now gotten it into striking distance of the fastest version that was submitted. Um, before I reveal the, the secret of the fastest one, let me tell you what the second fastest version did, and that was to subdivide the space. The world, the, the entire world here, contains all the objects in it, and the, um, the rays are being tested against literally every single object in there, and objects are made of triangles, and there's, so each ray is tested against literally every triangle in the space. So a little bit of rough first pass approximation can cut down the number of triangles you have to test. And so the second fastest submission used AABB versus AABB to subdivide that space and to just say if the AABB that encompasses the line segment does not intersect the AABB that encompasses the soup object, then there is no need to test those at all. And so that, uh, that student just made AABBs around everything, tested those first, and only if those pass, then would go into the more complex calculations and got approximately the same speed as what we have now gotten with this. Presumably, if we apply both of those optimizations, we could probably go even faster. But as we've seen before, we're going to need to test that. And now let me tell you uh, what the winning submission did and frankly what is probably the absolute easiest way to optimize this and the most versatile as well. And that is simply multi-thread this thing. Here we are looking at speed test. Speed test is running thousands and thousands of tests uh, in sequence and they do not depend on each other. All we have to do is take this piece here and throw that onto separate threads and we can throw as many CPUs as we have available at the problem. And this is going to work for basically any application. It doesn't take much understanding of what is under, underlying any of this code. It's not very complicated. So let's do that real quick. Um, I'm going to need, let's do thread with just standard thread. Uh, let's do that. Um, I'm going to take, to make this more convenient, I'm going to take this piece and throw it into a separate function. Uh, boom. So that I can chop that up to separate threads. I'm going to need to get the world. So that is a physics world reference world. I'll make it a const referenced. And I'm going to need my array of lines. So those are const physics uh, line segment pointer p line. And I'm going to need, uh, probably tell me how many to do in the batch. So int num line. Num line goes there, ba 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 ba. It's all the same. Okay, and I'm just going to convert this to a call to my ray batch. The world, my lines, and all of them. So all that is doing is I'm preparing to thread that. I haven't threaded that yet. I've just converted it to a function. I want to verify that I haven't negatively impacted anything still works 3000 milliseconds okay now let's split this up into separate threads i'm going to need some threads so let's say uh, num threads how many threads am i going to have equals i'm going to say uh, let's give myself some threads. Um, how many threads do we want? Let's say const int num thread. Let's start with you know, four. Let's get four threads. We're going to throw at this. And we're going to go... I call it num thread.
Okay, let's make a new thread for each one. P thread of I equals new standard thread. And uh, we need to put that function in there. We need to capture some stuff. So we're going to say, uh, I'm going to capture the world. I'm going to capture P line. And I need to capture anything else. That's probably it. Oh, no, I need a starting point. It's not P line that I want, is it? Uh, let's see. And that's a, whoops, boop, boop, boop. And I'm going to call Ray Batch. Ray Batch with the world, and it's going to be the address of P line. Uh, let's say ray index and then the number of lines I'm going to be doing is num ray divided by num thread and I need a ray index so I'm going to say int ray index equals zero and ray index plus equals num ray divided by num thread What's the issue? This is called P threads. Uh, we, we haven't captured ray index. We're going to need that. Ray index. OK, that's all of them. And then I'm going to need to wait for those to finish. Do a little uh, fork and join. threads by join and delete it because if you call new you must call delete all right and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put pound if around this so I can keep my original there for comparison now did I get this right um, Okay, I'm buying that. That looks good. Let's see what happens. 800 milliseconds. So that's pretty freaking fast. And what's more, I have more than four CPUs on this machine. Let's go nuts. Let's make it 12. 390 milliseconds to do the entire batch. Remember, we started with over 20 seconds to run this thing uh, by doing just by removing some unnecessary variable copies. We got it down under 10 seconds. Then by caching up some calculations to avoid repeated calculations, we got it down to about three seconds. And then by splitting it across multiple CPUs, we've got it down to less than half a second. So those are the big ones. There are some other fun things that you could look at if you wanted to explore, um, some people have suggested perhaps uh, a quad tree, a quad tree to subdivide the world so that when you do your AABB tests, even those could be optimized. Um, we could add the AABB to this and the quad tree to that to get it even faster. And finally, I'll suggest the last big improvement really is uh, throw this onto a compute shader. This could all be done the uh, compute shader over on the GPU uh, with amazing speed. And I guess after that, you could start looking for truly low level optimizations. Have we optimized our cache? Can we organize our data structures in better ways? Um, and, and things like that. The biggest, most significant impact we had with any one of these efforts was the multi-threading. Multi-threading was not a lot of effort Really, um, if you have a little bit of familiarity with one of the various uh, threading APIs that you can use, and that works on virtually any scenario where the results of one batch do not de depend on the results of another batch, you can just split them up any way you want and uh, get as much speed up as you want. The other things that we saw 
big, big speed improvements from just don't make extra copies of local variables. Uh, just get in the habit of always using the original source when it's available or make a const reference to it so that you can give it a simpler name if you want, but don't make a local copy. And then the next thing we did was lots of caching of calculations. If the calculations are being done over and over and over, can we get an advantage just by doing that calculation once and holding on to that value? And the last thing that we mentioned, but we didn't actually apply here, is doing coarse collision tests for this collision pass. This is a, a collision test and it's a fine grain collision test. We should maybe do a coarse pass first, possibly AABBs or uh, quad trees, maybe some of both. And that'll do it for this video. If you have any questions or anything to contribute to this conversation, feel free to just jump right into the comments down there. And to the students who participated in this challenge, thanks for being such good sports. I'll see you all again soon and stay in touch.